Hello, today we're going to talk about IT, and this, this video is specifically for IT people. I'm John Rinaldi from Real Time Automation, and I normally talk to control engineers about things going on in the manufacturing floor, but today I'm doing a special video for our friends in IT to explain the 10 things that they need to understand that are different between IT and what goes on on the factory floor in terms of networking. So the first thing I want to talk about is architecture. So the, the architecture is obviously different. Well, maybe, maybe it's not obviously, we'll see. So here's, a, here's kind of a sample architecture. And I mean, this can be done lots and lots of different ways, but this is one way. So I've got a, I've got a couple of routers. I got some industrial switches. I got PLCs. I've got devices, got some PCs. This could be a factory floor machine. Each of these could be two side-by-side -side machines. So it's interesting, you'll notice right away, is that we've got a string of devices here. Those are our I.O. devices, and they're, they're put together in a string because we can't afford to have each one of these connected to a switch. It costs too much money. So we use embedded networking where there's an embedded switch in each one of these, and you create a linear network. Sometimes this linear network routes back, and you can, we create a ring. So those are things you never see in IT, is linear networking. You never see uh, things like uh, embed, you've ne embedded switches and devices connected to other devices. They're always connected to a switch. So the architecture right away we see is going to be quite a bit different than what we have. We have linear networks and rings. Second thing, let's talk about, about devices. Devices on the factory floor are a lot different than what, than what we find in IT. What do we have in IT? 99% of the devices are Windows computers, servers, computers, and printers. That's a, that, that, and, you know, so that comprises almost, almost everything. On the factory floor, we've got every kind of device imaginable. We've got some really low power device, really low, low functionality devices like a photo eye. So all it does is sends out a bit when the beam is broken. Or we've got really complicated devices like a Yaskawa drive that may have thousands of configuration parameters to make that drive work. So we've got a whole different, the devices can be literally anything. They're, they're physically different sizes, different shapes. Some of them are DIN rail mounted, some aren't. Uh, they, the amount of data that they send out varies completely. How they get their IP address, another big difference between IT and OT. In IT, everything gets its, its, its address in DHCP. On the factory floor, it's, we use a little bit of DHCP, but not much because when this device fails, and this is device, say, dot, you know, whatever the, the subnet is, it's going to be dot 22. We just want to pull, a da pull another product from stores, stick it in there, and put it, set it to, to dot 22 and be done because we don't know this PLC has to know what that device, what the address of that device is. It can't, we can't take a chance that when it goes to the DHPC, DHCP server to get an address, that the address is going to come back different. So how devices get their IP addresses is different. How they get configured is different. Some of them need no configuration at all. You can get these devices so that they're all pre-configured and the, you, all, they have little switches to set the last octet. So they have three switches, that, so you can set what that last octet is. That's pretty simple. Or you could be like a drive where it comes with a web server for configuration. Some devices, not so much anymore, but used to have their own utility program for configuration. So it's all, you know, just all completely, you know, all different kinds of ways of configuring them. So our devices are completely different than the devices you're going to find in the IT world. Let's talk about VLANs. Typically, in the, you know, one way you use, you know, VLANs, of course, are used lots and lots of different ways. In the IT world, one of the ways to use VLANs is to put all the infrastructure devices on a VLAN so they all can talk to each other easily. We use VLANs here uh, basically for broadcast domain limitation. We want to limit the broadcast domain. So, for example, we would probably put this linear string of OT devices on a VLAN so that the broadcast, if you've got 250 devices here, we don't want all of that traffic coming over and screwing up the controller. This stuff over here, non-IO devices, would be on a different VLAN, so we, so we limit the 
amount of broadcast traffic that we get. We would also, we generally set up, you, you would want to advise people to set up a VLAN on the router that's not connected to anything else so that no corporate traffic can come into the network. And plus, to make you guys happy, we don't want to, we want to make sure that none of the control system traffic gets on the network. So we use VLANs a little differently on the factory floor than are used in the IT network. There's another, you know, this is kind of a, you know, this is no particular order. Another thing that's different is cyclic, we use cyclic communications. So over here, we use a lot of, you know, on the IT world, a lot of HTTP. Open a connection, do a get or a put, close the connection. Over here, this PLC, this controller is talking to this device and they have an open connection and they use that connection forever. And typically, if this is an Ethernet IP system, they're doing cyclic communication. So the controller will say to this device, and let's say this is a linear actuator. Let's say, I'll just say it's a temperature controller. It's going to say to it, I want you to send me your data every one millisecond. I'm going to send you some communications every five milliseconds. So there's this cyclic communication, and that literally goes on forever. If the machine's running, if the machine's not running, as long as the power's on, this cyclic communication is going to be, is, happens. So it's totally different than, than what happens in the IT world. So cyclic communications and other things. Uh, IP addressing, IP addresses. So we talked a little bit about that with the architecture, but IP addresses, we try to keep everything. So one of the big advantages here, uh, one of the things we want to do is make it easy to troubleshoot. So well, pretty much it makes a lot of sense is you have a, a set, a subnet, and the controller's always going to be, this one's always going to be .10, and, this, and it's going to be off a subnet. So you be, the, the idea here is that when you look at this address, you'll know that, oh, that's the machine A PLC controller address based upon what the IP address is. And then if you look at the, an I.O., if you look at an I.O., the I.O. probably would, you know, I think a big difference here is this I.O. string would probably have exactly the same address as the I.O. string on, an, on the next, on the other, on its sister machine. Why would we do that? That kind of violates everything in IT. You never want duplicate addresses. We do that here because it's easy to, we want to be able to copy the program. If these are sister machines that work identically, we want to be able to take the program out of this PLC, put it in this PLC, and because the I.O. addresses are exactly the same, it, there's nothing else to update. So if you make a change here, boom, you can just download the program over there and everything just works. So we keep, we, keep, we have duplicate addressing in the, in the OT world, something you'll never find in IT. So we, we structure, we do a lot of fixed address also. Why do we do that? Because as I said before, when we do a device replacement, we got, it, we got to uh, just make it easy to put that device back in and make sure it's going to work with the PLC. So IP addressing is completely different. Let's talk about something here. This is another a concept that's probably un unfamiliar to the IT people. Lockdown. What's lockdown? Well, once you, you know, a lot of these machines are, these are mechanical systems. These mechanical systems are subject to mechanical limitations. Things wear out, things happen. So, you know, and we, 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 the timing is critical on this. So we don't want, so if we've got this device here, I'll call this device X, we don't want to, if device X fails, we don't want to replace device X with device, which is release 1.1 with device X release 2. We don't know that release 1.2 is going to work exact way, way that release 1 worked or the previous version. It may change the whole timing. The machine may not work now. Now, when you test a machine out, uh, sometimes it, it takes an hour. Sometimes in, say, a pharmaceutical machine, this thing will, will, will take weeks or months to test and cost millions of dollars to, vet, to certify the machine. That doesn't, that's not acceptable to just go and change this component, you know, and it upgraded from Rev 1.5 to Rev 2.5, and now we're going to go and spend hours, weeks, months, 
spend millions of dollars to re-verify the machine? That's not good. That's not good. What we do is we want to lock this down. Every device here has a particular software release and particular hardware release. We're going to just always keep the same stuff and keep it forever. That's lockdown. And it's a big advantage because then when you know that when you replace something, the machine's just going to work and you don't have to worry about it. Big problem for cybersecurity that I'll talk about in the next video. This is actually part one of two videos. So, all right, another thing, traffic. Traffic in an, in an OT network is fixed. This PLC is always talking to this device at the same cyclic rate all the time. This, this Windows PC is always monitoring, showing stuff from, is accessing data table entries here, the same one all the time. This device is doing the same thing. All of this traffic is fixed. Anything that's going up to say this is a, uh, this is in quality, this is a quality PC, it's gonna monitor, it's monitoring say five values out of this PC and 10 values out of this one maybe. It's always going to use the same messages to get the same amount of data. Nothing changes. In the IT world, traffic's changing all the time. You know, somebody comes in with a new laptop, some a new, new printer, there's somebody running a new application program. You have no idea what the traffic on the network is gonna be. We know every single message that's gonna be on this network all the time. And anything else that doesn't belong there, we can pick that out. And that's one of the big advantages that we'll see in the next video when I talk about cybersecurity for this. Another thing, run real-time operation. Real-time operation. This stuff is running at real time. This stuff, sometimes, if you're filling a bottle, you've got to have microsecond response because when that beer bottle, when the liquid gets to a certain level in the beer bottle, you've got to shut that valve off. And sometimes it takes a few microseconds to, 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 to turn the valve off physically. So, you know, the PLC's got to adjust that over time as that valve ages and takes longer to shut off. PLC's got to do that. All that stuff's got to be done in microseconds or millisecond kind of time frames. So the time frame we're talking about here is totally different. So this is a real, these are real time networks, which is the reason we have the cyclic communications that we have is to, is to because of that real time nature of this. And you know, we're talking about going to publish, subscribe in the future. That may or may not work, but it's, it's you know, it, it, we really need determinism here. We really need these machines. Sometimes they don't need any determinism, depending upon what they do. Other times that they really rely on deterministic behavior. So we've got a whole range of stuff regarding real-time real -time behavior. Uh, let's talk about the troubleshooting. In the IT world, you, you, can, do, you can pretty much you know, do troubleshooting remotely and it's it's pretty straightforward this you know this 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 thing is talking the server's talking or it's not and if the switch has failed then a whole bunch of things have dropped off you kind of know really really quickly the problem we have with troubleshooting in the ot environment is that we don't know if dot 22 devices failed we don't know if the cables failed we don't know if the switch has failed we don't know if the application program in the plc has failed there's a whole bunch of things to to look at and rule out. And what a lot of people do is they, they just quickly replace this device and, and it doesn't work. So the system still doesn't work. So then they start looking at cabling and start looking at other stuff. And uh, it's a lot more, the troubleshooting is a lot more sophisticated and somebody needs to be able to access this switch locally in order to, in order to figure out what's going on. And let, that'll be another point that I'll talk about when we get to uh, security, which is, you know, the next issue I wanted to just touch on is security. All right. So in the IT world, you know, uh, threats are, are huge. There's, they're coming from all over the place. You've got people trying to attack the network from the outside. You've got people coming into the office with uh, laptops that are infected. You've got all sorts of problems. People download stuff all the time. You know, our, our problem on the factory floor is a couple of things. People are, you know, everything really revolves around this PLC. 
that has, sometimes has very confidential data on it. So people want to attack it and try to get that confidential data. Sometimes they want to change values in here. Everything really revolves around, that's really the, the biggest threat that people worry about is somebody getting into this PLC. Now the other kinds of threats are, well, what if they, you know, if this device here, this is device A, you know, the vendor, you know, is this the, when the vendor shipped this device to the distributor, you know, typically the way this happens is, in a lot of cases, is that so, the, this, the, the, the vendor that makes device A is gonna send that device to a distributor. It's gonna sit on the shelf over there. A machine builder is going to buy it. It's going to sit around the machine builder's uh, facility as, while they're building the machine up. Then it's going to go to some test facility, it's, and the machine's going to sit around there at some test facility. Finally, it's going to be shipped to the end, end manufacturing plant where it's going to be put into production. Anywhere along that way, if somebody can, can they get in here and change this code? I think that there's there's low probability of that, and it doesn't worry me too much because, all in the past anyway, these things were all embedded microcontrollers that required you, you really had to have the original source code in order to do anything with them. Now, if these are Linux and Windows boxes, it's becoming a little bit more problematic, and we have to worry about is this the same code that I got when that, that, spoke, that the vendor shipped that ended up on the manufacturing floor. Now I know a great big automotive you know, company that got hit with WannaCry. They bought a machine from, from outside and they got hit with WannaCry. It had, it had WannaCry in one of the Windows PCs on that machine and then it uh, infected that machine. That machine was infected and it got on the network and infected a whole bunch of other things. Uh, so everything here, you know, when you talk about security, it really is the controller is the thing that we're most worried about. The nature of the threat is different, um, and it's it's um, it's a different kind of. It, it, there's some advantages and there's some disadvantages to to securing the manufacturing floor. So today I went through ten things. I mean, there's many other things, and this is just a quick survey. There's other things that are different between IT and OT. But here's 10 things I think you IT people should really understand about manufacturing systems. In my next video now, I'm going to talk about you as the IT guy. How can you, what do you need to know to secure this kind of system? And we're going to really get into the specifics of the cybersecurity. Thanks for watching. I look forward to talking to you in the next video.